Dan Myers, uh, his family moved to the Longview area in uh, 1948 from Minnesota. He uh, graduated R.A. Long High School. And uh, I mean, and this is the bio that Dan provided me. He had a short stint in the U.S. Navy and ended up in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. The Navy my dad was a member of didn't usually have the ships go that far in one. But. It was a submarine. <laughs> uh, while in Phoenix, he began a 40-plus uh, year career as a computer programmer and uh, systems analyst. Uh, he programmed in uh, 15 different programming languages and 10 different operating systems. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's more than my time. Uh, he returned to Cowlitz County in 1974 and uh, was the only IT manager ever employed by uh, Tollycraft Yachts. His hobbies include woodworking, furniture making, metalworking, stained glass, uh, antiques, including cars, houses, furniture, and clocks. He currently serves on the uh, Kelso City Council. Uh, he is on the uh, board of the Lower Columbia CAP and executive committee of Cowles McKayla Council of Governments. And he happens to be spearheading the petition drive to repeal the Kelso City Charter. So, big uh, lion's welcome for Councilman Dan Myers. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to come in and talk to you today. I'm going to talk about training for volunteers. And uh, it's, a, it's a program that I, I feel really strong about. <clears throat> there are only two uh, staffed two depots staffed by volunteers between uh, Los Angeles and Vancouver, BC. Only two. Everything else has some paid employees working there. Uh, the two are Olympia and Kelso. Interesting enough. So with, um, when we get started, I, I feel like I should say something about the, the Navy. Uh, the Navy didn't get me in, in Phoenix. My parents moved to Phoenix while I was in the Navy. That's why. <laughs> uh, in the Navy, I was in Memphis, Tennessee. That's better too. Yeah, that's better. Uh, when, when we got started, we um, there was a, a couple of people from the volunteer group in Olympia and some people in an advocacy group called uh, All Aboard America that came to one of our council meetings in Kelso and said they would like to see a volunteer program at the depot because it was a nice building, there was nobody there, and it was kind of intimidating for some travelers to come there when it's empty. So I volunteered to take that project on and wrote bylaws and the articles of incorporation and got filed with the Secretary of State all the things we had to do to get all organization formed. And then we had our first public meeting in July of 2009. Had a good turnout there. About 60 people showed up at the meeting and we got a lot of enthusiasm going. Not all of them were train enthusiasts though. I think it helps to be a train enthusiast, but it's not essential. There's a lot of fun working with people and uh, but I thought to help get some enthusiasm going for trains, this thing is kind of in a strange position there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so to get some enthusiasm going, I thought it might be nice to cover some of the history of the trains in the, the Pacific Northwest. So we'll look at Abraham Lincoln and how does he fit in? Well, he was uh, in, in uh, 1864, he signed the Northern Pacific Charter. That charged the Northern Pacific Railway Company uh, with building a rail line from the Great Lakes to Puget Sound. And the route they were going to go, of course, followed down through the gorge, so they needed a north-south route running from uh, somewhere down near Vancouver up to Tacoma, which was going to be their terminus on Puget Sound. The first section of the railway was, was uh, built between Kalama and Tacoma, and that was uh, started in 1870. And by, by January 1874, they had regular service going between Kalama and Tacoma. 
When uh, one of the stops, it was a whistle stop on the on that route was Crawfordsville or Crawford, and that's what now we know as Kelso. But it got started by Peter Crawford, who came here from Scotland and and surveyed the property and laid out the town and and got started selling property around there. And he got some claim to it, I think, through uh, what was it called homesteading, and then he was able to divide that up. <coughs> To um, get a better idea, I think, of what was going on at that time, I put together a little bit on the history of what was happening in this country about that time. This, if you recognize it, it may not, is the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was under construction. It actually started in 1867. But nine years later was when we saw Custer defeated at the Little Bighorn. Think about it, we got railroads being built, between Kalama and Tacoma, and uh, we're fighting Indians out in the Dakotas. <laughs> in 1881, Kelso was actually incorporated into the community. And in 1883, the Brooklyn Bridge was completed. In 1886, the Crawford family donated some land for the first depot. And that was just a small wooden structure, but it would provide a place for the train to stop and people to wait for past or for, for, to get on board. It had a small freight depot along with it also. And then in 1889, Washington actually became a state. So you see, you look at that history and you realize there was a lot going on in this area and the trains were a big part of it. In just a few years, train travel was flourishing. And uh, here we see in 1901 a train approaching the, the then depot in Kelso. But to get between Kalama and, or get further south from Kalama to Portland, you had to cross a ferry. You can see uh, the train there vaguely on the left. Uh, there's a nice model of this ferry boat over in the uh, Historical Society, they've got a really nice model someone built of this, this ferry. But this ferry then was running on regular basis, several times a day, bringing trains back and forth between Gold, Oregon, and Kalama. And in 1906, Kelso petitioned for a better station, because they were getting a lot of traffic, and they asked Northern Pacific, could we get a better depot in Kelso? In 1908, the Vancouver to Portland Bridge was completed, and they no longer needed the ferry. The ferry was now out of service. And by 1911, uh, <coughs> the new brick depot in Kelso was well under construction. It was uh, actually dedicated on February 12th, 1912. And it was just, this was just uh, five, six or seven years before Longbell decided that they wanted to expand their their timber operation in the Pacific Northwest. They had come up here and looked it around. And, and uh, in 1921, Wesley Vandercook set up his office in Kelso. And they brought up 100 men. And they worked on surveying all this property that had been acquired by Longbell. And as word spread, this is a rumor I've heard. I cannot, I, I tried to verify it. It's a good story. Uh, so I'm going to tell it. I can't say it's actually a fact, but the story goes that when uh, word about what Mr. Long's plans were for this area, Kelso just rolled out the red carpet. You know, this is economic development, this is, uh, this is jobs, this was a lot of things coming to the area. They thought this was a really good thing, and they rolled out the red carpet and told Mr. Long that Kelso could be renamed to whatever he wanted that fit his vision for the area. And he told them that he didn't want a Stumpfield mill town to be part of his plan. <laughs> I think that was probably, if that's true, it's probably the start of some rivalry that still goes on today. So you still have the stumps? Huh? Uh, we've moved the stumps out, yes. Keep, keep in mind that I grew up in Longview and I now live in Kelso and I'm a council over there. So I, I, I'm close to both cities. I, I don't have this conflict within me, I guess. Um, 
Now, Mr. Long needed uh, a train to be able to bring his logs down from Ridewood, where he set up his, his headquarters camp. He was needing the railroad. He asked the MP of Northern Pacific if uh, he could bring some logs over that route and connect to that from Ridewood. And he was turned down. The, the reason given was safety. They felt logs might fall off the train going through the tunnel at Rocky Point, and other trains coming into the tunnel wouldn't know their logs were there until they hit them. And they, so they, they denied it, and uh, his solution then was to build his own railroad. If you recall, or maybe you know, uh, they had the, uh, uh, a holding company that was actually owned wholly by Mr. Long, and he's the one that built, they're the ones that built the rail, railroad. This railroad uh, went up the west side of the college. See a picture there looking at uh, southbound over by Beacon Hill. And I think the cuts in the hill there are probably about where Alpha Drive and, and uh, Nevada Drive come down off the hill there. And to get the logs through West Kelso, there was probably also another conflict with Kelso. They didn't want to disrupt the traffic, so they required them to build an overpass. This is in West Main in Kelso. And you can see on the, the right side there, you can see the, the towers on the uh, Allen Street Bridge. And a lot of people were never aware that this was ever here. Long also wanted passenger service to come to Longview. And he sought permission from the ICC. And of course, Kelso opposed. <laughs> we, had, we had more opposition. But Mr. Long felt that he couldn't grow the city if he didn't have direct passenger service into town. And uh, so to help for that end, they built this beautiful depot with this clock tower, and that was at the uh, east end of Broadway. I, those that have been here a long time will remember the depot. It turned into College General Hospital and was eventually demolished, and it's now uh, another medical facility there this time. With this depot, uh, which they rented to uh, Northern Pacific, they got permission then from the ICC to start bringing passenger service into Longview. And the trains would go on north through West Kelso, up along the west side of the, the Cowlitz up to nearly to Vader, and then they could cross over and reconnect with the main line up there. You can still see some of the uh, right-of-way down there behind Columbia Ford, you know, the dike where the line used to run. Um, I think I've got another one here. Yes. Uh, forgive me for bringing up the Columbus, but... Uh, <laughs> this was probably the celebration of the trains coming in. I don't have an exact date on this picture, but it was taken near the, uh, the Longview Depot. And... Uh, I think OSHA granted all the permission for those people to stand there. <laughs> there was no OSHA. Yeah. No. Okay. Now, what happened, they started bringing passengers in in 1928, but five years later in December, they had a really bad flood and washed out a lot of the tracks. We saw some damage <coughs> all along the line. Uh, trestles washed out, everything washed out. And being in the middle of the depression, they didn't, uh, didn't decide, they decided not to put money into rebuilding this rail line. So part of it still exists, but most of it is gone. Uh, there's a fellow from the uh, Historical Society that's done a great documentation on the old right of way, and he's got a lot of pictures in one of the uh, recent quarterly magazines from the, from the Historical Society. After World War II, Northern Pacific uh, began a great big modernization. They tried to modernize a lot of things and expand their capacity. Rail, rail profits were good. And this is when they put another 40 feet on the Kelso Depot. You can see on the roof there what's the new part. Um, it's lighter color. So that was added to uh, handle more freight capacity here in Kelso. 
but even that didn't last very long. In the late 50s, uh, trains started to decline in popularity, they, uh, especially for passenger service. I mean, cars were much more prevalent, roads were getting a lot better, and Boeing had uh, launched its first jet airliner. So there was a lot of ways to travel that bypassed train. Plus, I think the ICC uh, had never revoked the wartime excise tax on rail tickets. So that was still in place. So it made it more expensive and not as attractive and not as convenient and not as fast. Rail fell into a big decline. There you go. In 1971, uh, that's an Amtrak train there passing at the Kelso station. And they considered Kelso at that time to be just a whistle stop. They didn't have regular stops there unless they had a flag up to bring it to a to signal that someone wanted to get on or off. <clears throat> and a gradual deterioration continued at the depot. It was closed in 1971 and sat vacant. No one was there except uh, transients and people who wanted to hang around there. Few people caught the train. It just wasn't that popular. Then in the early 90s, Congress <coughs> passed ICT, if you recall, I don't remember what that stands for, it was some transportation bill, and they designated Seattle Eugene as the Pacific Northwest Rail Corridor. And that was important because that brought funding in and the vehicle was renovated in 94 and designed it, designated a multimodal transportation center. And Greyhound was coming in there. Uh, they actually had office space. Uh, Amtrak chose not to put an employee there because they didn't feel there was enough passenger service to justify that. But they had a number of things there that, that made it uh, a pretty nice depot. They even put in retail space in the basement they thought would um, help cover the cost of maintaining the building. Unfortunately, that retail space never appealed to anyone, it seems, and has never been occupied in the 20 years since that was put in. I guess it was occupied for a short time, and we have one tenant in there now uh, who's with the National Transportation Safety Board, and they, they issue, uh, take, take uh, applications and do the uh, transportation workers identification cards was known as TWIC. So we got a few people coming and looking for the TWIC office and we just sent them down the hall. <clears throat> oh, I got something over here. That's going back. <coughs> and when we got formed, our mission statement was to, to provide as much as possible volunteer staffing for the Kelso Longview Train Depot to assist travelers by announcing arriving and departing trains, answering travel-related questions, and to be courteous ambassadors for the community. That was our goal. That, that uh, mission statement was developed at our first meeting, first public meeting. And it's a lot of fun to work there. You meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, most everybody's traveling. When you're traveling, you're usually in a good mood. You're looking forward to a vacation or coming back from a vacation or something. There's, there's some business trips. Uh, you see the Saturday morning sometimes as a big group goes up to a game in Seattle. Those are always a fun group. We've seen 50 or 60 get on the train at one time just going up to a Seahawks game or a Mariners game. <coughs> so what we try to do is we try to have someone there seven days a week, 12 hours a day. We go from 8.30 30 at morning until 8.30 30 at night. That covers all the trains that arrive in Kelso, if they're on time, and not always on time. And you, and you meet some very interesting people. I've talked to people from foreign countries that have stopped in Kelso. Uh, and the, the atmosphere in the, in the depot, because we're not a very busy depot, is very conducive to conversation. A lot of people will take the time to chat. It's a very interesting place to work. And one of the people that my wife met was Dominic Gospador, if you know who that is. 
He's the one that created this. And you all know what that is. You yeah. all see that. And he made a lot of money in, in natural gas and in real estate investments. And uh, he liked to talk. He talked to her a great deal about how he felt. He was very emotional and passionate about this, this monument. Uh, I think he's since passed away. And, but she did talk to him for about a half an hour. So we announced trains. We help people with the, with the ticketing kiosk because the, that intimidates some people. And uh, we return a number of wallets, purses, luggage, cell phones, that sort of thing that wouldn't get returned if there wasn't somebody there to deal with. And what we do is we keep a log that we can write in. I don't write very much because I'm not much of a writer, but uh, people like to make entries about something that happened on their shift. And I wrote down a few of them or copied a few of them that I want to read just to give you an idea of what's going on. November 26th, today is Thanksgiving. It has been a neat experience as 91 passengers arrived by train today. It was wonderful watching the happy faces as they saw family and friends there to pick them up. I enjoyed talking with passengers as they waited for loved ones to arrive. There seemed to be excitement in the air this special holiday and we're glad to have been able to be part of it. December 15th. A passenger was going to miss his connection in Portland due to the 513 being two hours late. I called an Amtrak agent and they helped to resolve the problem. December 20th, number 14 arrived eight minutes late with a passenger having some drug problems. Three police and three paramedics came to evaluate the passenger and took him to a local hospital. December 23rd, a gentleman from Woodland needed assistance getting on the train to Bellingham and a tearful young woman with Down syndrome had gotten off a southbound train in error. She was bound for Vancouver. So we called relatives and she was picked up here instead of putting her on the next train. <coughs> December 30th, a bag containing a cell phone was found by the ticket window after 7 p.m. I placed it in the back storage room, lost and found. We do keep a lost and found. And this particular phone, uh, I happened to see it back there and it was charged. And so I went through the phone book and there was one called SIS so I just punched that dial sis and she answered and I told her that we found this phone at the depot and she said it was her sister's phone and uh, I said well we'll have it here when she can come pick it up. Well we got a phone call a little bit later and uh, she was very happy to get her phone back. So that's what I'm here today for. Go ahead to the next one is to get us some more volunteers, because we're a little bit short now. We've had some people dropping off for various reasons. Uh, and if you've got some time, we'd certainly like to, to help have you help us out. I've got some brochures here that tell a little bit about how we do it in a little more detail. And I have some applications, so anybody wants one of those. What about the future? Let's get the last slide here. The Pacific Northwest Rail Corridor is one of 11 federally designated high-speed rail, rail corridors in the United States. The Cascadia High-Speed Rail is a proposed railway that would run from Eugene to Oregon, Eugene, Oregon to Vancouver, British Columbia. The corridor is owned by BNSF in Washington and British Columbia and by Union Pacific in Oregon. If improvements to the corridor are completed as proposed in the Washington State Long Range Rail Transportation Plan, they hope to have passenger trains operating at a maximum speed of 110 miles an hour between Portland and Seattle. And so they right cover that in yeah. two hours and 30 minutes. And between Seattle and Vancouver, BC, in another two hours and 37 minutes. That's the plan. And maybe you'd like to be part of it. Thank you. Again, on behalf of Lincoln Pioneer Alliance, I'd like to present you with this money. Oh. It doesn't come with anything, but you put anything in it you want. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.